Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Matt Glotzbach, Product Management Director, Google Enterprise. <laughs> hey, Ken. Thank you, everyone. How's everyone doing this afternoon? Good? It's good presentations. We're, uh, we're almost in the home stretch. Uh, we saved some of, the, some of the best for not quite last, but near the end. I know, you know the afternoon rolls around, the, the pastries at the break. You might be getting a little sleepy. You're in those wonderfully comfortable chairs. Uh, I saw someone back there figured out how to recline it all the way back, which was nice. That wasn't in the 45-minute demonstration. Uh, but the session we have lined up for you today, uh, this afternoon, uh, we termed Google Transformers. And this is really the best part of my job. Whenever somebody asks me, well, what's it like to work at Google in the product team? I always get to say, the, the best part of my job is I get to look across the veritable R&D candy store that is Google and look at all of the great technology and innovation that's occurring and figure out how and, and what of that we can bring into the, enterprise, uh, into the enterprise space. So for this afternoon's session, rather than spend a lot of time on, uh, on various slideware and, and hearing me talk, I've invited some of my colleagues from across the product team throughout Google to come up and give you a flavor of some of the interesting things that are happening uh, within Google on the R&D side. And so uh, rather, than, rather than lead on, without further ado, I want to first invite up Sundar Pichai. Uh, Sundar leaves our, is our vice president of client products. He leads all of our development on client-side technologies, including Chrome and Chrome OS. And Sundar's got some, uh, some interesting things to talk to us about in terms of where the web is taking us. Sundar? So thanks, it's great to be here, uh, especially talking about Chrome and Chrome OS to this audience. I think it has a lot of potential in the enterprise, and so I want to spend some time talking about it. So let's get started. Uh, let me get the handler for the slides. Great, so, so the journey, journey for all of this started with Chrome. So rewinding back, we started working on Chrome about four years ago. And if I were to go back and distill the inside of Chrome into one thing, it would be this. While Ken is working its way back to the slides, thanks. Uh, it is that the web had changed from simple text pages to a world of web applications. So that is the single insight on which uh, Chrome was built upon. So if you look at the slide back there, on the top left, you have Amazon's site in 1995. It's tough to believe, but that's how Amazon looked like about 15 years ago just a page with simple, uh, simple text links on it. So this is how almost all the web pages around that time were. Fast forward to 2010, and what you see there is Google Maps with Street View. You can drag it, you can move it around, users can interact with it, they can click open and see a photo of the actual building they're looking at, et cetera. So these are very rich interactive web applications. So back in 1995 and so on, these kinds of applications used to be outside the browser. So operating systems used to handle these applications, not the browser. And most browsers, in fact, most modern browsers actually have their origins back to 1995. And so these browsers were never meant to handle web applications. So what we set out to do was to build Chrome from the ground up to be a modern platform for web applications. So we used WebKit, which is a great fast rendering engine, and then we literally rebuilt everything else. So Chrome has what we call V8, it is a completely new JavaScript engine, which is much faster than, the, than all other JavaScript engines out there. And then we built a multi-process architecture. This is nothing new. It's what operating systems do. So we brought the principles of operating systems to the browsers. So process isolation. How do you make sure you protect one process from each other, making the right trade-offs? So we made sure the browser can now adapt to the world of web applications. And so that's what Chrome was all about. So how, how are we doing? It's been 18 months since we launched, and we are over 50 million users who use Chrome as their primary browser. So we count only users who use it as their main browser. So the growth has been uh, pretty phenomenal for us uh, since, since we launched. And we focused on three things with Chrome, speed, simplicity, and security. So Chrome is very fast. It's a single common feedback we get from our users, that they feel it is fast. And so we've spent a lot of time optimizing speed from the time you click the icon to how you, when you surf around web pages, et cetera. The second thing is simplicity. Uh, with Chrome, we really want users just to enjoy browsing the web and using their applications. We don't want them to feel the browser. So you never see an update screen with Chrome, for example. You install it once, 
and we manage it end to end for you. So the entire experience is designed to be very, very simple. And finally, security. Uh, security is something we thought from day one and built from ground up. Uh, as an example, there is a, there is a conference called Cansec West, which is a very popular security conference. And there is a competition in it called Pawn to Own, in which uh, people get, I think, roughly about $10,000 if you find an exploit on the browser, and you get to keep the computer from which you found the exploit. So you can imagine the kind of crowd it attracts. And uh, last year, almost all major browsers uh, didn't last beyond one hour of the two-day competition. Uh, Chrome was not compromised after two days, and, and the same result repeated again this year. While it's not possible to design a foolproof security system, I think by thinking about it from day one, you can inherently design a much more secure platform. I'm sure it's something you all care about a lot within the context of the enterprise, so I want to talk about that a little bit. So speed, simplicity, and security, and, and that option has been great. More importantly, one of our goals with Chrome was to really drive innovation uh, you know, even faster in the browser space. Just as an example, uh, if you look at IE9 and the announcements which are coming out of IE9 around JavaScript engine speed, et cetera, it's great to see that. So both HTML5 and JavaScript, all browser vendors are working on making the browsers better, uh, which is very, very exciting for us to see. So next slide. So when, when I talk about Chrome, there is Chrome the product, what users see, but there is also the web platform uh, which we care about deeply. Because our vision, in our cloud computing vision, we see users using all their applications within a browser. And, and so the browser is actually the platform. The browser needs to provide the capabilities so that web applications can get better. So HTML5 is, is, the, is, the, uh, is the phrase we use for the collection of web technologies which power web applications. But what we want is today there are limitations. Web applications cannot do certain things that desktop applications can do. So we have a long list of all, those, all, all the areas in which we need to improve. And we are working along with other major browser vendors to add capabilities to address these gaps. Let me give a few examples so that it's clear what I'm talking about. Let, let's take a simple use case, notifications. I'm sure you're all used to seeing Gmail or Google Calendar in a browser and there is a meeting. Today, you know, it's tough for the web, web applications to notify you about the meeting. What if your browser is closed? Or what if you're on a different tab? So in HTML5, we are adding a capability for web applications to provide those notifications. It'll come from the bottom of your uh, you know, computer screen. Uh, so that is one simple example of the capability we are adding. Going on to more complex things, uh, let's take threads, for example. Most modern hardware ship with multi-core processors. So threads, or workers as we call it, gives the ability for web applications to run background processes so that they can use the second core on the machine. Um, most computers today also ship with a speaker, a microphone, and a camera. Today there's no easy way for web applications to talk to each of those peripherals. So how do you make that happen? So in each of these cases, we are working with other browser vendors to expose APIs so that web applications can take advantage of it. And any changes we drive here, you will see it implemented. Web, you know, web developers will use these functionalities to create much better web applications. Local storage, graphics. Over next year, with, with WebGL gaining traction, you're going to see much more advanced graphics and 3D games on the web, as an example. So it's an area we are very, very excited about, and we are investing a lot there. So, so we, we invested in Chrome uh, and, and invested in HTML5, which is the web platform which powers these applications. And confluent with that, you know, it's what we call a perfect storm of converging trends. Um, more and more users are living in the cloud. In the consumer space, it's very obvious. If I look at PCs and I look at the last five years, for consumers, uh, outside of games, any application which has reached 10 million users, they've all been web applications. Facebook, Twitter, you can, you can name these applications, but none of them is a desktop application. So users are dramatically moving, at least in the consumer space, to completely living on the cloud. And we see the same trends in the enterprise as well. So this is something very exciting for us to see. We measure this, so this is not something. So when people use Chrome on their machines, and, and you know, when we can measure this, we realize most of the time on the computer is spent within Chrome. So, the question is, what can you do to design a computing experience around it? In addition to that, there's a revolution underway just in personal computing from a hardware standpoint. 
There is, there is a lot of revolution in the semiconductor architectures which power these computing devices. Phones are getting more processing power. Many smartphones today have the same chips which computers had two or three years ago. Likewise, computers are becoming much more mobile. They're getting lower power processes. So you can carry these computers, and they're getting data connectivity as well. So there is a very, very interesting transition underway. So the question we asked ourselves was, what if you rethought personal computing for the day of the modern web? What if you could design the entire personal computing experience around this trend of cloud computing? And that's what Chrome OS is all about. So it wouldn't be surprising to you the three things we are focusing on, Chrome OS is speed, simplicity, and security as well. And you know, cloud computing is a word which gets used a lot. Uh, you know, in the case of Chrome OS, we plan to walk the talk. It is a real cloud computing uh, paradigm which we want to present to our users. It's designed to be very, very fast. So uh, you know, from the time you boot up to your end-to-end -end experience, it is much faster than what most people are used to. It is very simple again. It's, first of all, it's a browser. That's the most common thing you see. It's a very intuitive experience for most users. There is no code to manage as a user. You can install applications, but these are web applications. You can install Facebook, you can install Twitter, you can install Amazon, New York Times, et cetera. But these are web applications. So users don't manage code on the system. We manage the entire image for the user, so people don't have to deal with software. People don't need to manage data. Just like when you use Gmail today, you always get the latest application. The data is in the cloud. You can get a cache copy for offline if you want. So that's the same model uh, which Chrome OS will work. So it's very easy for me to take someone else's Chrome OS device, open it up, log in, and get my session back, just like you, you can do with Gmail today. So simplicity is a core part of the goal. Security, I talked about how Chrome is very secure. With Chrome OS, we have gone back to the basics again and we are redesigning the entire operating system to be very, very secure. So to start with, Chrome OS understands the underlying hardware, and we do something called verified boot so that we can securely boot up the operating system. Once you're in the operating system, first of all, users don't install any code on the system. Secondly, it's based on the web security model. In current operating systems, users have to make the decisions about whether they can trust an application. And once they install an application, it gets access to everything on the system. Whereas in Chrome OS, we fundamentally assume everything is untrusted. So everything is sandboxed with multiple layers of protection. And if something goes wrong, we can easily revert back to a known good image. So again, security is a very, very hard problem. But by thinking from the ground up, you can design much more uh, secure systems than what are out there today. So what does this all mean for the enterprise? So this is an area of we are very, very excited about. I fundamentally, you know, when, when you look at the personal computing model in the enterprise, we think there is scope for a lot of improvement. Um, within Google, uh, you know, I look at the amount of money, resources, time we spend on administering the devices we hand out to people. It's a very hard problem. And, and um, uh, for example, if I go to our support organization, these people are the consumer support organization, they're doing a terrific job. What they do all day is they, they are in discussion support forums, et cetera, answering email and supporting our consumers. And they're spending their entire day within a browser. But the devices they have, and then the administration and the cost of ownership on top of these devices is staggering. I fundamentally think we can rethink this model with something like Chrome OS and, and really change the game here. So it's something we are very, very excited about. Uh, a demo is worth a 1,000 words. So I'm going to turn it over to Ken, who's the product manager on Chrome OS, to show you a short demo. Great. Thanks, Sundar. So I'm super excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, one of the greatest things about working at Google is really getting to see and try out some of the new and exciting innovations that come through the pipeline here on a pretty regular basis. Uh, but even more exciting than uh, getting to try or even see this is getting to show it, especially to an audience like this. Uh, 350 of the world leaders in technology is, uh, is really, really exciting. Um, so before I get started, one of the things I just wanted to caveat here is uh, we're still more than about uh, half a year away from shipping. So a lot of what you see here today, um, just because of how fast and how often we iterate, uh, can and most likely will change. So don't get too attached to any of the UI or anything like that. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, because, uh, again, we're so far away, um, we're constantly making uh, changes and getting new builds. So I'm just pulling these builds off of the, the, the build pipe. So I pulled a fresh build off of the build pipe this morning. So there might be a, a couple crashes here and there, but bear with me. Hopefully the demo gods will be good to us today. Um, 
One of the first things I wanted to show you, as soon as I sort of alluded to earlier, was we're very, very focused and care a lot about making this device and this uh, software as fast as possible for the user. Uh, and one of the first things that people think about when they think about speed for a device is how fast uh, does it boot up, right? Like how fast can I go from hitting the power button to actually doing something useful? Um, so I've got a Chrome OS device here, uh, <coughs> and I'm just going to hit the power button. Um, so if you guys will count with me, uh, we'll see just how fast we can get you to the login screen. So ready? One, two, three, go. 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. So we've gotten it down to about a little over five seconds. And our goal here is really to get it uh, under five seconds by the time we launch, right? Um, and that's from a cold boot, right? So it's not in standby or anything. It's completely powered off. So now if I can bring it back to the uh, primary display here, you'll notice we've actually been running this uh, presentation from a Chrome OS device. So one of the first things you'll notice is uh, it's just Chrome. Um, so some of you might uh, be a little bit disappointed that it's not some radical new UI. But to most of you, this should be a relief, right? It means that um, you're not having to learn a completely new paradigm or new interface. Uh, <clears throat> as it turns out, um, all the internet users in the world already know how to use a browser, right? Whether it's bookmarks or tabs or URLs, people understand how to use it. Um, but there are some key differences. Uh, for example, the primary applications on this device will be web apps. So we've done some work here to really try to emphasize and bring out and surface web apps on the top layer. Uh, one such example here are um, what we're calling pinned app tabs. Um, so it's a way really for you to keep your uh, most commonly used applications uh, pinned uh, in a consistent place that you can always get back to easily. So if I open up you know, um, new tabs, uh, these pinned tabs stay right where they are. Uh, and in fact, I can even go and close them, uh, but they're still there. So what happened there was I actually deallocated the resources and shut down the app. So it's no longer running. So it's no longer taking up your memory, your processors, or anything. However, if I want to get back to it, I just click it, and it uh, loads immediately. Another thing you'll notice here is we have this icon in the top home button, uh, which is what we're calling the app launcher for now. It's almost like a start menu for your, um, your favorite web apps, right? So I've got a list of apps here that I use uh, quite a bit, like, for example, my Google Docs list. Uh, very simple. Um, <clears throat> but app tabs or tabs aren't always the best uh, user interface for all your use cases. For example, if I wanted to do uh, chat with some friends, right? Um, I probably don't want a full screen tab for that. What I really want is maybe a panel type uh, form factor. And maybe I actually want to drag it here to the side and dock it so it's really easy for me to get access to these friends, even when I'm you know, looking at primary content over here. All right. Hey, have you seen this presentation? Send it to him. We can talk about it, discuss it, maybe even edit on the fly. Um, but maybe I want to take some notes uh, with it too. So I'm going to drag this off to the side here as well. Demoing at Atmosphere. <laughs> One of the great things about having a web-based operating system is all your data, all the state that you've accumulated over the time, gets automatically backed up and synced into the cloud. So what that means is, while I was typing notes here, it was already sending that information to the cloud. So um, if I go to my Google Docs and click the notepad, you'll see. Um, all, my, all the data that I've already typed is already there. Um, <clears throat> but one of the common use cases people have isn't actually uh, new uh, notepads or um, chatting with friends, but opening up documents that they already have, like PowerPoint files or Excel files, um, something that you know, a, a browser doesn't necessarily have today. Fortunately, there are different ways and web apps out there that already solve some of those problems for you. So let's say, for example, if somebody gives me a USB stick and it's got an um, <coughs> Excel file on it, what happens when I click on this because I don't have Excel launched? Well, let's see. Google Docs to the rescue. Um, so what happened there is uh, we actually uploaded the Excel file into Google Docs. It converted it on the fly. And now I have this high fidelity Excel spreadsheet. So I can now edit it, share it with friends, whatever. It's really, really simple. But it, this isn't just true for um, files on USB sticks. This is true for any file. Uh, on the web, right? Let's say I was looking for a PowerPoint um, on Virginia for Cozers. So I just click it, 
uh, again, Google View or G View um, automatically converted this on the fly, so it's really easy for me now to uh, scan through it, find the relevant content I need, copy and paste. It's really fast, right? Uh, if you would have tried to do this on a PC, it would have taken like a, at least a minute or so for PowerPoint to load and then for the file to convert and so forth. Um, so it's really fast. We're focused on making this as fast as possible for end users. Um, <coughs> so now some of you might be saying, that's great. You've got you know, great use cases for text files and so forth. Um, <coughs> but uh, what about... Um, what about your other state? Like, for example, your bookmarks, your, uh, your, um, uh, your themes, uh, your preferences, settings, and so forth. Um, does that all stay, get all synced and backed up to the cloud? Yes. So we're focused very much on trying to make sure this device is completely stateless. So if you, uh, one of your employees ever loses their device or uh, gets stolen or gets run over by a truck for whatever reason, uh, all that information is already automatically backed in the cloud, so all they need to do is get a new device, log in, and all of that comes back. So if I can get uh, the second uh, device to show up real quick here. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to show you is actually live sync. So it's even faster than the backup and uh, sync down use case, right? Um, so let's say I went to CNN.com, and I decided to... And I really like this site, so I'm going to bookmark it. If you notice on the second device, it's already there, right? Uh, the same is true for, um, let's say I wanted to change the look and feel of my device, right? Maybe I want to customize a theme. One of the nice things about uh, <coughs> Chrome is um, it automatically uh, it lets you uh, um, change the look and feel as well. And you can see on the second device, it gets automatically synced and changed as well for you. So now you don't have to, have to worry about backing up your user's data anymore. It just gets automatically done for you. Um, <clears throat> so finally, I want to talk a little bit about just how powerful these web applications can be. Right? You've seen uh, this uh, work for things like you know, Excel files, PowerPoint files, and so forth. But what about media-rich applications? Right? Uh, what about things like graphs, being able to make flow charts, uh, maybe even edit video? Um, well, as it, as it turns out, there's some really interesting um, <clears throat> web apps that take care of this already. So uh, Gliffy.com is actually a, a, a great little app that um, is very similar to Visio um, or OmniGraph if you use a Mac. But it's so fast to load. And I can create a whole flow chart here in just a matter of seconds. Maybe I want to connect some of these points. Right? A couple more. It's really, really easy to use. Um, so in a matter of seconds, I've got a flow chart. Um, but what about video? Yes, we can do that too. So uh, there's another uh, really interesting um, web application called JCut. And so what they do is actually have a very, um, <laughs> very rich uh, video editing uh, uh, app. So for example, if I wanted to create um, a couple of apps here, maybe I want to add some transitions, right? Um, let me preview this. And there it goes. Uh, here it is. So obviously I'm not a uh, professional video muscle. editor, uh, and in I probably shouldn't quit my day job for that either. But in a few seconds, I was able to create a pretty slow nice slow uh, video with the some transitions included as well. Um, <clears throat> so that's just a little bit. Hopefully you've seen just how fast uh, uh, this device Using can be, how simple it can be to use, and how powerful these web applications Here can really be. Time, um, but with that, um, I'm going to stop and hand it right back to Sundar. Thanks, Kev. So uh, we are working on this very actively now, uh, can pull something live from development. As we said, our plan is to have this for consumers uh, uh, towards the end of this year. and uh, but but I'm really excited about the potential for this for, for the enterprise because of the cost of ownership uh, advantages it provides. It's going to be much simpler to administer than the current personal computing paradigm. So we are looking forward to working with Dave Girard's team uh, to bring this to the enterprise in the future. So with that, I'll turn it over to Matt. Thank you very much, Sundar. Wow, 
I, they better not leave these laying around. They might disappear before uh, for the next coffee break. But uh, thank you very much. That was some, uh, some pretty interesting stuff and shows you uh, how far the platform of the browser has really come and what you can do with that. I wish my laptop booted in five seconds. I wish my laptop booted in five minutes. Um, so uh, next up, we're going to show you on top of this powerful platform, which is the cloud and these modern browsers, you can do a lot of interesting things with applications. And you've seen a few apps uh, that, uh, that Can showed throughout his demo. Uh, but to show you some more of what we're working on on the, uh, on the Google side, I want to invite up Bradley Horowitz, who's our Vice President of uh, Applications and Social uh, for Google. And Bradley's going to show you some of the really interesting things happening on the app side. So Bradley, thanks. Cool. Thank you, Matt. And I also want to welcome Rajan, who's going to be driving uh, the demos. Uh, in the spirit of this session, I've got no slides whatsoever. It's all demos. You can hold your applause or applause as you see them, whatever, <laughs> whatever works for you. So we've all heard that the cloud is the future. And I think after seeing the uh, Chrome and Chrome OS demos, uh, I hope you'll agree with me that the cloud is now. The cloud is the present. And if you're not convinced yet, you will be in, in 15 minutes. Um, so. As an exercise at first, I'd like all of you to take a moment and think about a web application that's been released in the last five years that you find really compelling. Something that's new, something that's interesting, uh, that's no more than five years old. OK, now I want you to think of a client application that's been released in the last five years that is new and compelling and different and innovative. And no cheating, you can't think of like version 11B of something that was created in 1976. Okay, if you're like me, the first uh, exercise was really, really easy. You might have thought of Twitter or Chatter or Buzz. Uh, the second one was harder. Um, I hope all of you immediately thought of Chrome. And most of the things that I think are interesting in the client space are those that are enabling this cloud revolution, things that are enabling the content to move seamlessly between the desktop or the netbook and the cloud. Um, and I think that this is really indicative. Uh, client applications in many ways are becoming extinct. And the innovation is really happening in the cloud. So I want to showcase some exciting advancements we've made in apps. Um, they kind of fall into three categories. The first is platform. The second is social, and the third is extensibility. So let's start with platform. Now the best thing about the web is that it's open. It's something that no company owns, and that makes it an incredibly powerful platform for innovation. Instead of 100,000 people trying to make the web better four years from now, you have 100 million people making the web better every moment. Uh, and I think most of you in this room, I hope, are familiar with Gmail. And Part of the top line selling points of Gmail, 25 gig per user, uh, the power of Google search in your inbox. But more subtle, and I think more important, uh, is the way that your mail interacts as a cloud-based application. And I want to showcase a couple of these examples for you. So let's start out with an email uh, that's in Japanese. If we could flip that up on the screen there. Now, First of all, the system is intelligent enough to know I don't speak Japanese. That uh, does not require a ton of intelligence, actually. Um, uh, I don't even uh, know where to start. Um, but the system detects automatically for me that Japanese is not my default language and offers me the chance to translate that and then automatically translates it for me. Now, what's cool about this is that this translation facility is constantly getting better. As we get more data, better algorithms, uh, this system will get better and better. You can actually read that there and see that it's actually quite legible and useful to me already. Uh, but the power of the cloud is such that we get constant improvement, constant innovation. That is only going to get better and better. Now, let's say I want to reply to this email. Let's say this email is something I want to react to in the moment, and I want to actually call a meeting to do that. Well, what I'm about to show you right now is something uh, that is new uh, and uh, has never been seen before. I would classify this as a prototype. Uh, this is not a product that we're announcing right now. It's just a work in progress, something that we think is interesting that we wanted to share with you today. So what I'm going to do is set up a virtual meeting room. So here you see multi-way, multiplexed video. 
So rather than uh, call a meeting and you know, gather in the future, if this is an important email, I can react in the moment. And as easy as passing a link around, people can click on that link and join this virtual meeting where we can interact. These are real people. This is obviously rigged. Um, wave to the camera, folks. If you can hear me, there you go. Cool. So this is kind of in the category of coming soon technology that we're playing with here in-house and figuring out how to deliver to you all. Uh, we're also innovating in other non-obvious ways as well. So I would venture to guess that most of you that made it to this meeting have executive assistants who manage your schedule in entirety. Um, they tell you where to be, when to be, etc. cetera. Um, those of you that didn't make it probably um, need new assistants. And you didn't hear me say that either. Um, so this is a, a trained art. We all know what it's like to have a great assistant who can read your mind and kind of channel your intentions and make sure that the right meetings happen. And this is really, really difficult. When you're talking about getting a room full of a dozen executives together, um, everyone's busy, everyone has constraints. You need to know who's critical for the meeting, who's in which time zone, uh, what are the constraints who's on travel, et cetera. And so we've thought hard about how to bring the power of the cloud and the intelligence that we have about users and their schedules to bear on this problem. Uh, in its current form, it's not gonna uh, put any assistance out of a job, but it's gonna make their jobs a lot more enjoyable and give them a means of up-leveling their work so that they don't have to do all the tedious drudgery of trying to line up schedules and things like that. So, uh, Rajan, uh, you can see here we have a smart rescheduler on the right pane there, and we're gonna ask the smart rescheduler to find a new time. It is now loading the calendars of this meeting, and if you saw on this uh, demo here, I think we have 22 guests uh, in five different locations, so it's doing an optimization to find and propose times that work well for this group. Now, as you see, it's very unlikely with 22 guests in five locations, you're going to um, find something that's perfect for everyone. Um, we do have the concept of working hours. Three in the morning might have worked, but uh, that's probably out of the question. Um, so what we do here is we expose the best possible solutions and we tell you about the conflicts so that you or your admin can decide um, which of these non-perfect solutions is the best uh, that you wanna go with and then schedule the meeting accordingly. Uh, and again, this has to do with understanding the cloud resident data and the habits and time zones and work hours of many, many people in many locations. Uh, something that is very, very tedious becomes much, much easier when the cloud is brought to bear. So I wanna talk now about social. And social is something we're obviously very excited about here at Google. Um, and I think in the business world, in the enterprise world, uh, things get extremely interesting uh, in the context of social. Um, sometimes I think social can bring up negative connotations of time wasting and you know social gaming and uh, you know did you see what Mary had for breakfast yesterday? Did you see her status and things like that? But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about bringing the power of connections between uh, knowledge workers to bear on the problems that we're all trying to solve every day. Questions like who's the resident expert in our company on topic X? Um, have you guys seen this news article? Have you uh, been exposed to this bit of breaking industry news? Uh, do you guys agree with this strategy? So all of these things that are kind of virtual water cooler, things that uh, you're looking for interaction and feedback around, things that might have gone out in a mass mail uh, in previous generations can now happen with the advent of these social tools. Uh, so uh, I wanna give you a couple examples of how we're using social signals to even make things like email better. So um, I imagine we've all had the horrifying experience of sending an email to an unintended recipient. Um, this is chilling, you know, you, you hit send and uh, you know, a uh, knot builds in your throat and you realize you've just pushed you know, the company's salaries to employee X. We wanna help you there. Um, and so we have a lab uh, that we call Got the Wrong Bob Lab. So um, here we have a couple of anneals. I imagine we probably have a dozen anneals here at Google. Um, and uh, Rajan uh, has the wrong one there. And you have a did you mean uh, Anil Sabarwal instead of Anil Hansji. Uh, and that allows me to kind of have a little speed bump. Before I click send, the system has alerted me and says, you know, it looks like you have the wrong person here. Um, how did it know that? it understands the patterns of email, and particularly that when I email Matt 
and Dave, it's likely Anil Sabarwal I want to email too. Um, another example of this is auto-suggest. So when I email Matt and Dave, um, it's suggesting names like Mark Crandall and me up there. So um, it's looking at the patterns and the auto groupings. And this is in the context of a user's private data. This is their data being returned to them as value, being put to work in their service uh, back for them. And so uh, very easily we can kind of pick off names from that group and auto create a group uh, that makes sure the email gets to exactly the right people. And that's really cool. Um, what I want to talk about next is Google Buzz. And you guys have seen us launch Google Buzz in a consumer sense and announce our intention to launch this to the enterprise, and it's something we're really excited about. One of the things about Buzz is that we've been using it here at Google for about six months, and it's completely changed the way we communicate inside the company. Um, I want to give you a couple examples. I, I think Sergey uh, said it well when he said, Buzz is like an email with no two-line. Imagine that instead of explicitly thinking about who I would need to address an email to, I craft the email and I send it off and the routing happens in an intelligent, optimized way so that the email reaches those recipients that need to see it. Uh, that can be because they proactively lean forward and expressed an, an intention to follow that topic or follow that uh, person who's sending the email, but it could also be through recommendations and routing. Uh, that help that email get to the right person. So here's an example. Uh, students at Purdue University are fighting to get Google Apps for their school. This is amazing. Do we have anyone reaching out to them? So this is kind of a virtual water cooler use case here where uh, you're posting that information and uh, it's automatically reaching the right people. Now those people might be sales reps in that region who have followed Mike because uh, he's known to bring deals for them. It could be that Purdue uh, alumni are automatically targeted based on uh, recommendations. There's a lot of means we have of helping uh, that get to the right people. But the important thing here is the dialogue and the interaction around this. This isn't just a one-way communication for broadcast. It's something that engages people and reaches a resolution. Um, so basically, uh, at the bottom there, we kind of have closure on this, and the, and the thread is now uh, ensconced in the corporate repository, and uh, the next time I do a search on Purdue, I can pull this up and revisit the information that was gleaned in this iteration. So it's an extremely powerful way for sharing knowledge within an enterprise, and we're excited to be uh, putting that to market shortly. So finally, let's talk about the third point, which is extensibility. And uh, we are really proud of Google Apps. We have been uh, working hard to bring better and better versions of them to you in real time, constant internet innovation. Uh, but we also recognize that Google isn't going to deliver every single app that your enterprise is going to need. And uh, as such, we've created the Apps Marketplace. Uh, the Apps Marketplace is great because it expands the reach of uh, apps uh, and does so in a way that leverages Google's infrastructure and this cloud-based computing paradigm. So things like CRM, HR applications, travel, expense reporting, the marketplace has it all. There are literally hundreds of apps that have been written in the short month or so since we launched this. So uh, Rajan is going to just kind of browse through these. You'll see that there's a lot there. Uh, the store itself has uh, ratings, reviews, lots of information that can help you make an informed decision. Uh, and we want to highlight one of these from a company that's called uh, Aperio. Now, if you guys are anything like me, you live inside your inbox. And uh, we all have different methods for getting things done. Some people flag things and revisit them later. Uh, in my own experience, what I find is if I don't uh, react to an email in the moment, and that reaction might be, uh, filing it away, it might be forwarding it on, it might be delegating something or replying. But if I don't react to that email in the moment, the likelihood I will ever get back to that email and address that open task drops by an order of magnitude. And so what I want to show you here is something that uh, brings that uh, phenomenon to bear and actually puts the relevant imp information and the ability to react and respond to that information directly into my inbox. So. This is a product called PS Connect by Aperio, and uh, it's using a technology we call Gmail Contextual Gadgets. So you can see this email right here, which looks innocuous enough. Great news, our office move is final. 
um, but it brings the customer information uh, to bear right in the conversation card of the email itself. So I can open that up. I can see more information about uh, that particular customer. I can see that even though this looks innocuous, um, uh, we need to hold on this deal until the office move has been finalized. The email is telling me the move has just been finalized. An action is implied. I can switch the context of the deal from stage prospect to stage qualified lead, et cetera. And uh, this is incredibly powerful. This is just an example. You can imagine many, many others that turn email from kind of a to-do list to a place where I'm actually getting things done and responding in the moment directly in the place where I already live. So I, I find this really compelling uh, and very, very powerful. Another uh, story around Excel, uh, accessibility that I want to make sure you guys hear is around Google Apps Script, uh, which is an exciting way to automate tasks within Google Apps. Um, let's say you're holding a marketing event. You need to send out a dozen invitations to all your prospects. Google App Scripts allows you to automate this task. So you can see here I have a, a mini spreadsheet, a mini database of this information. Um, and the script that we've built here um, allows you to um, automatically uh, craft a template here. Here you can see kind of a form template um, and pull in those variables from the cells of the spreadsheet to create a very customized uh, invitation to this. Um, so I've got the contacts, I, I run the mail merge there and I say send invitation and we're going to use all of this information, we're going to drop in their, uh, their uh, first name, so you say dear Dean, we've used the location of their businesses to give them customized driving directions from their office to our office, et cetera. And this is just a toy app, uh, but it, it speaks to the power and the kind of customizability that Google Apps Scripts brings you, and we're looking forward to see what you all and the community of developers do with that functionality. So we've talked and shown you guys a lot today, uh, the power of the platform, the power of social, the power of extensibility. Uh, we hope you're already thinking about what it means for your business. Uh, but what I'd like to ask you guys to remember is the most important top line message, the cloud is here, the cloud is now. And with that, we'll turn it back to Matt. Great. Thank you very much, Bradley. Thank you, Rajan. Wow, so uh, that, that rescheduling uh, meeting that, that Rajan showed was actually my staff meeting. So I think 3 a.m. is an absolutely appropriate time if everyone can be there. Uh, but no, thank you very much for, uh, for showing that. So we've seen the power of the browser and where we're going with HTML5 and how you can rethink the, the computing paradigm in the cloud. We've seen demonstrations of some really powerful business apps, uh, including those of social and how you can extend them. But if, uh, if you all are like me, you spend very little of your time at your desk. And so everything you're doing in front of a laptop or in front of a, uh, in front of a desktop computer is, uh, is becoming less and less of your time. You're spending more of your time on a, on a little screen about yay big, and, and you want to figure out how that factors in. So uh, my next guest I'd like to invite up is Mario, who's our vice president of our Android product team. And he's going to talk us through and show us some of the neat things that are coming on the mobile side. Mario? Thanks, Matt. Okay, so thank you. And Mary Meeker spoke earlier about the explosive growth of the mobile internet. We believe that better browsers, simpler data plans, and smarter phones are key contributors to this trend. Uh, we heard Sundar talking a little bit about how uh, the modern smartphones have the computing power of our laptops of possibly just uh, less than three years ago. And these devices are also connected to vast computing resources in the cloud. At Google, one of our goals is to ensure that all of our cloud services are uh, available on the, the vast uh, diversity of smartphones and, and mobile devices that are out there. At Google, we're also working, uh, we're also continuing to invest in the development of our own mobile operating system, which is Android. Android is a really good example of this very fast growth of the mobile internet. Uh, from Mary's stats, you may be able to do some calculations and, and figure out that we're seeing more than 60,000 Android-compatible uh, device activations per day uh, today, and that's really only six uh, sorry, only 18 months after the, the first Android device came onto the market, which was the, the G1. So we're seeing very, very fast growth, and Android is also a good example of how 
smart devices connected to the cloud can give you a really powerful combination. Before I go into some demos, I do want to uh, give you a little bit more context on Android, just a few sentences. So I'll start with the user. As we've heard here, our, our, our users, they, wanna, they want to access their email, they want to access their social apps, they want fully featured browsers, they want to search, they want to download all kinds of apps and games, they want to consume content like video and books and so forth, they want to be able to have their contacts and their, their uh, photos synced, and they want to do this all the time, even when they're on the go, especially when they're on the go and not necessarily sitting in front of their, of their laptops. And so it's really in order to fulfill these consumer desires that we've built Android. Android is a free, powerful, open source operating system and applications platform that enables handset makers to innovate really quickly and to bring internet connected devices to, to market at a very low cost. Our strategy here at Google with Android is to contribute to a more innovative, to a better web. Uh, we want to enable more people to access the web, in this case through, through mobile devices. And we want to uh, do that across a broad range of device form factors. And we also want to, and, and that means we're really trying to put the cloud into, into people's pockets. We think this is good for users, for the companies they work for, it's good for the, for developers, of course, uh, it's good for partners of ours in the Android ecosystem. And for Google, from a strategic perspective, it's good, it's good for Google because as the mobile internet grows, as the internet grows, uh, so, uh, so does Google. So um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on, uh, on, on slides here. And actually, I don't have slides at all. This is my one and only slide right here. And we're going to transition to, uh, transition to that. I'm going to do four demos to show you the the power of modern mobile devices and their connection to, to the cloud and how this is, and the, and the cloud connection is actually changing how you're, you're using your, your mobile devices. So let me uh, make sure that I'm gonna talk about these four applications in the right order for you here. So I'm gonna power on my, my Nexus One Android device and I think a few of you may have one of these as, as well. So you'll be able to play with this, uh, be able to play with this later on. The first product I'm going to talk to you about is, uh, is voice. Voice is a product where you speak into your phone and our systems in the cloud transcribe your voice into text. Now, voice recognition has been with us for about 20 years, maybe more, on your PC. And uh, you may remember the voice recognition on your PC not being very good. I think what's important to remember is that the voice recognition engine when you were running on your PC was running on that one machine, on your, on your, on your machine. But what we're, do, we're about to show you is different. What we, what we do at Google is we take your voice, we compress it, we upload it to the, to the Google Cloud, where not one machine, but hundreds of machines, sometimes maybe thousands of machines, process, process it very quickly and return text to, uh, to your mobile device. And why is this better? This is better, first of all, because it makes the result more accurate. We have a lot more voice samples to, to work with. We're familiar with more intonations and more, and more accents. And our algorithms are constantly learning. And so that's one of the reasons why it's good to do this uh, in the cloud. And secondly, because we can handle and add languages as we, as we go along. So our, our uh, speech recognition product today has uh, supports English, Japanese, Mandarin, and we're about to add German, and that's something that we've already, uh, that we already talked about a few weeks ago. So let me, let me show you this, and we're gonna show you this, as I said, on, on my Nexus One here. So here I am, and um, uh, I'm gonna start with a voice search query. Pictures of the Golden Gate Bridge at sunset. So very quickly here, a couple of things happened. This was about a second, right? Um, so I think the text is exactly what I spoke. Uh, yeah. And not only is, this te is the text perfect, it went to these thousands of machines in the cloud, came back as perfect as, but you also got a result. And you got an image, uh, an image search result with, uh, with the pictures here. So really amazing, really, uh, uh, really, really cool. Now, 
Um, what, we, what we did with the latest version of the Android operating system, though, is since this is so useful, and I use this all the time, but not just to search. I use this wherever I see a keyboard. So what we did is wherever you see a keyboard on this Android device, on your Nexus One Android device, you're also going to be able to, to speak your, your input as, uh, in addition to, to typing. So let's see how, that, um, how that's going to work. So let's say that I'm going to send a text message. And um, here's where I'm going to send a text message from. Now, when I click in the, in the field where I'm going to enter my, my text, you see a little microphone here. And I'm going to speak a, uh, an SMS message. Let's play tennis at the high school later on today. So once again, you have your, so you're, it's much easier to send a text message like that, especially text messages that are, you know, a lot of times really, uh, really short and you don't care about the accuracy. But even the accuracy here is, is very, very good. So again, this is voice recognition using the power of the thousands or many more machines that are, that are uh, in the cloud. OK, so that's, uh, that's one, one cloud service. I'm going to transition to something that we just talked about a little, a little bit ago, which is translation. In this case, I'm going to show you translation from a mobile device and how, uh, how this is changing how you interact with your, with your phone and even with, with other people. So there's an, there's an app in the Android market called uh, Google Translate. And uh, let's say that we're traveling in Peru and we don't speak Spanish, but we want to go, we want to find out what time the, the museum opens that we want to, to visit in Lima. So we call up the uh, Google Translate app on the Android phone here. And what we can do is we can simply input the, uh, what we want to be translated, again, through voice. What time does the museum open? And again, very quickly, you see that. What time does the museum open? And you already have a translation here. A que hora abre el museo? And so you've got two cloud services in one here, voice recognition and translation. And remember that we, uh, we translate between lots of languages. And in Bradley's presentation, you saw the, the long list of languages here. But here, let's say that you're so uncomfortable with Spanish that you can't even read that, and you want your phone to speak the, 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 uh, the result for you. So you just click on the little speaker here. So the, the phone will, will speak the, from, the, from the, the speech to, to, to text engine that's, uh, that's on, on the phone here. It will speak that for you. Now, how does this work? The sent was sent in English to, the, to Google servers. Uh, Google servers know how to translate between 50 languages. And this, is, this works really well again, because first of all, we're able to do this really fast. But we're, we're able to, the algorithms are able to learn. And so not only does the speech recognition get better, but the translations get better, given all of the different samples that we're, we're able to, uh, to work with. And we're also able to add languages um, uh, very fast. So that's uh, Google Translate, and again, showing a couple more cloud services. Let's go to something which <clears throat> you might think we've figured out, and, and uh, it may not be make, make for a very exciting for a very exciting demo. But let's talk about contacts and the interaction of the cloud with contacts or address book, because this is also uh, pretty cool and, and amazing. So we all know address books. And let, uh, let, I have a, a contact here that I'm going to show you that I synced with my exchange contacts. And I have the person's name and telephone number, but I don't have much more information. But if, <clears throat> and it could be that this person's telephone number changed, and I'm, I'm out of date. So what changes with the cloud is that a lot of us maintain profiles in services like Twitter or Facebook or Buzz or in, in other services. And this phone here can connect to those networks and pull your profile um, information. And actually, what's happening is, let's say that I'm going to show you in a second, um, uh, I have a contact for Alex. And I only have limited information for Alex. But I know that <clears throat> my phone, since I'm logged on to Facebook, sees Alex's profile on Facebook. And in Facebook, there's more information about Alex. And so my phone is going to pull that <clears throat> information together and, and, uh, so that you have richer information about this person. So if I go to contacts, and here's Alex Miller. And I was just mentioning Alex. And you'll see here that there's a lot more information about Alex here than just his name 
and his, uh, his uh, mobile number, which is what I have in my exchange contacts. Again, my Nexus one, <clears throat> through, the, through the contact APIs we have, went to, went to uh, recognize that Alex Miller has a profile in Facebook, that I'm friends with Alex Miller, I'm logged into Facebook, it pulled this information down, and then I have a lot more information about him, including the fact that um, Alex's last posting to Facebook was four hours ago. He's saying that he hopes it doesn't rain tomorrow. So when I call Alex, I can actually mention something about the weather, ask him if he was going to go skiing or, or go play tennis or something, if, uh, if I thought that that was what he was going to do. Again, this brings a uh, relatively uh, simple, mundane application, you might think, together with the cloud to give you a much more, uh, more powerful experience. Now, what we're not doing here, of course, is we're not taking the information we had for, uh, about Alex in, in the exchange context and writing it up to, to his profile in, in Facebook. We're bringing that down on the phone, but the, the sources are, are remaining intact, of course. So uh, that's a third, uh, the third service I wanted to share with you. The fourth example of the power of the combination of these smart mobile devices with the cloud is maps and turn-by-turn -turn navigation. Um, a lot of us have GPS systems in our cars, and every four to six months, we get a CD from the manufacturer. We take our car in for service, and, and the information gets, gets updated. Uh, what's different about what we're doing is that maps and turn-by-turn -turn navigation is always connected to, uh, to the cloud. And so you don't have to get a CD. You always have the latest information about your route, about restaurants, about uh, streets, and, and so forth. And, and they give this, this makes the, the tool very powerful in a number of different ways. And I'm going to show you a, a few examples of how this, this changes the way you use your, uh, your phone. So I'm going to go to Google Maps on my phone here. And I want to go have lunch with some friends at the Hobies in Los Gatos. So I'm going to go in, and I'm going to search for Hobies. I had searched for Hobies, but let's just do it. Hobies. So did you mean Hobies? Yes, I meant Hobies. And so here, I immediately have all of the different Hobies on this, on this chain, which, um, which, are, uh, which are near me. The phone has a GPS, knows where I am. And I said that I wanted to go to the Hobies in Los Gatos. So I'm going to, uh, here's the Hobies in Los Gatos. And I will click on that. And immediately, again, my connection to the cloud makes this uh, a pretty powerful um, pretty powerful experience. First of all, because I didn't have to sit at my desk and say, oh, I'm going to Hobie's. I looked up the, the, the address and wrote it down so that I can get to my car and enter an address in, in my car. I just spoke Hobie's here, and I have from Google's local database, which was because I was using Google Maps, I have Hobie's. I don't even have to remember uh, or write down an address. And then once I have the, the, the restaurant I was looking for, then there are a number of different things I can do here. Uh, I, there are reviews, but I know uh, Hobies. But if I didn't know Hobies, and let's say that I wanted to see what the intersection looks like where it is, I can click on Street View, and we have a, uh, you can see here that I can take a look at, Hope, and there's Hobies right there. That's that, that green uh, awning back there where that SUV is turning in. So I see where, <clears throat> I, I can see that. I can call Hobies and see if they'll, uh, reserve a, a table for me or hold a table for us. Uh, but I know where I'm going. We're going we're gonna to all meet there, and I can just launch navigation. <clears throat> so I launch turn-by-turn na uh, -turn navigation. And again, I have a, a GPS here. And you can see here that I'm being told that it's going to take me 36 minutes. Now, I checked this query before, and it said 23 minutes. So it's changed. The reason it's changed is because this estimate is being given me based on real-time traffic information in my route, in addition to the distance between where I am and where I'm going. So uh, let's turn on a couple of layers here. So one layer is let's turn on satellite. So that's kind of cool. You're seeing where you're, uh, where you're going. The other layer we can turn on is let's turn on traffic view. So when I turn on traffic view, I can see here that near Saratoga, I've got some yellow and, and red spots. And again, we're taking. In, in the cloud, we're taking this information and we're calculating how long it's going to take me to, uh, to get to, to Hobie's. And let me turn off, the, let me turn off the, the traffic here. Now, I remember that I'm running low on gas, so I want to stop 
and, and see if I can, uh, let's go to the, in my, in my route, I will see some gas stations. And if I go forward here on the map, I should be able to see, I'm gonna run out of gas if I don't, uh, <laughs> if I don't find a gas station here soon. Here's one right there, the Homestead 76. So, so wherever there are gas stations along my route, I should be able to see where they are and I, I, I can tap on them and, and um, that's where I'm going. One more interesting uh, feature here is you click on what my next turn is gonna be and my next turn is gonna be to take 17 South to Santa Cruz. I can click on Street View and I can go from Satellite View to Street View to see what that turn is gonna, is gonna look like. Again, just using all the services that are available for me in the cloud and what we try to do is there are a lot of these really good, interesting services. And when we build these applications, we try to bring them together in a, in a way that makes the user experience powerful through the combination of, of these, uh, these services. So we can go back to my, uh, to my route. And, and that pretty much uh, wraps it up in terms of a few things that I wanted to show you in, uh, as far as apps on, um, on my, uh, on my Android phone and how the apps themselves are going to the cloud and using the cloud in a very powerful way. Now, the, I'll just, what I'll do to, to wrap up is I'll give you one final example of a different way that we're using the, the cloud. When I got this phone here, I, um, I, there, there's a lot of interesting things I do with the phone to personalize it. I have my own wallpaper, I have my, my bookmarks on my browser, and I have a number of other things. If I lose this phone, and I, let's say I get a, uh, another Android phone, the moment I log in to my Android phone, because my settings are saved in the cloud, the moment I log in, first of all, all your contacts will sync, all your email and your photos and everything will sync. But the, set, the, the personalization of the phone is also stored so that all of the Android market apps that you download it will be automatically restored to your phone. All of your bookmark settings, your Wi-Fi settings, your wallpaper will be restored and many of your system settings. So this is another way that we use the cloud so that when uh, you get a new phone, you're up and running right away as opposed to having to take a long time to get, uh, to get set up. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Marissa who's gonna to talk to you about search. Thank you. Thanks, Mario. Well, uh, uh, I'm very thankful to the Android team because they, uh, with, with the speech to text, uh, they, they've now saved my life because I'm no longer driving with my, my, my knee trying to text message. But then I found I start looking at the, at the uh, street view of the driving directions and almost kill myself again. So it's a, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, we're running a little behind time, but uh, we, we, uh, we have one other, uh, other presenter who it wouldn't be a, a set of Google demos if we, uh, if we didn't invite Marissa Mayer on stage to talk about uh, some of the interesting things Google's doing with search. Uh, Google is the vice president of search and user experience, uh, largely credited with driving the simple yet powerful user experience that you all know of in, uh, in Google.com. So please welcome Marissa Mayer. Thank Thanks, Matt. Hi, I'm here today to talk about the future of search. Uh, and while search is actually in a state where it works really well for most users, we here at Google actually think that search is just getting started. And there's a lot of new and exciting ways that search is going to change and shape what's to come. And when we think about the future of search, we think about four main areas. Modes, media, personalization, and language. So some of these are obvious, some of these aren't. What do I mean by each of these different topics? First off, we have modes. Today, the mode of search is you sit down at a computer or on your phone and you type in keywords and you get back a list of links and references. That works really well, but we think there's so many other ways that people could search. They could search by voice, as you've seen with some of Mario's demos. They could search by concept, an expression of concepts rather than an expression of keywords, by sight. There's a lot of different ways people could search. I think of myself as a search addict. I do as many searches as I think probably anyone could do a day. I think my average now using Google web history is I do about 60 searches a day. And when I take, keep, keep track on particular days of how many searches do I do versus how many searches do I think of, 
I only do about 20% of the searches that pop into my head on any given day. So we know that there's a lot of different ways where if we make search more convenient and change the modality of search, ultimately people will do a lot more search. We also think of this as an omnivorous search box. Basically a search box that you can hand anything to, be it an MP3, be it a, uh, you know, a piece of spoken text, a piece of, of concept or photograph, and the, and the search box will do something intelligent with it. But we're really excited about how the modes of search will change, especially using cell phones, cars, et cetera. And we have some interesting demos to illustrate this uh, in just a few minutes. Um, the next piece that we think a lot about is media. The web is always changing and expanding in terms of the types of media that are available on it. When Google started, we really focused hard on web pages. But today, with the explosion of different media types online, images, video, now with tweets, we've actually had to do a lot with our search to expand the types of results that you get. We call this universal search. And universal search really strives to bring all these different types of media together in order to give you, the user, a much richer answer. But with the web constantly expanding, not only in terms of just the sheer volume of information, but the different formats of information, <clears throat> we're really excited about what this could mean in terms of the different media involved in search. Then there's personalization. When we think about the future of search, we know that those search engines will be better than they are today. Part of that is just almost by induction. Google search gets better each and every day. We release somewhere on the order of two to five changes every day of the year that ultimately improve Google's search ranking or our search UI. And when we think about personalization and, and how it pertains to the future, we know that those search engines in the future, when they're better, some of the ranking changes will because, be because they actually know you, the user, better. Maybe you'll want the search engine to know where you are so you can find restaurants nearby. Maybe you'll want the search engine to know your preferences so it can change the ranking of your results in order to meet those preferences. Maybe you'll want it to know your social circle so you can find a recommendation from your friends. These are all ways that search could become personalized that could be really powerful and impactful for our users. And the final area is language. As you can see, Google, from Mario's demos, Google actually ha has been doing a lot with translation. We've been investing a lot. The quality of our translation is great. And when you think about how translation applies to search, what it really is about is it's about unlocking the best answers in the world wherever they are in whatever language they're written in. And so when you think about can you issue a search on Google and actually have it translated into 50 or more languages, have us run that search on your behalf in all those languages, and then bring you those results, which we can also translate for you uh, with using that same translation software. And so we're really excited about how translation can really improve the comprehensiveness of search and also bring many more expert opinions to search. So we actually have demos that are going to illustrate each of these four main concepts. And to do these demos, I'm going to invite Jack Menzel, who is our group product manager uh, managing universal search efforts here at Google. And we're going to do a few uh, quick examples of how we're pushing and, and advancing in each of these areas. All right, Marissa, thanks. So I'm Jack, and I'm going to show you guys a qu few quick, really, uh, really exciting demos here. And uh, so, Marissa, you started off your talk by talking about uh, search modes and how we're really pushing the boundaries of you know, what it means to interact with search and the different ways to do it. So I want to start off by uh, a, a search that I actually do a lot because I'm kind of an architecture buff and I uh, love to look at buildings. And, and I, like to, I find myself looking at pictures of buildings a lot. And I have a hard time, you know, like imagine you're, you're looking at this picture of a building, which is a pretty stunning building here. And you don't really know anything about it. You don't know where it is. You don't know what it is. You know, like, how are you going to find it? Like, Marissa, like, given that you have to just input text into a box here, like, how are we going to find this? Medieval church, four tower structure. Yeah. It's pretty hopeless. Huh. I'm glad all you guys have really comfortable chairs, because for the rest of the demo, we're going to spend nine hours, and I'm going to go through 100,000 uh, churches for you right now. And I, I want you guys to, like, raise your hand when you see this one. No, we're not really going to do that. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to show you how, um, with Google Goggles, um, a really cool way you can do this is to search by site, where instead of going through 10,000 churches, I'm going to go over here, and I'm just, I'm a tourist. I'm having a lot of fun. This is great. I'm taking a picture. Oh, yeah, there we go. OK, now I'm going to run over here. All right, all right, go to the, go to the screen. Go to the screen, because we're going to beat the, get the result here. Watch this. Are you guys ready? 
Oh yeah! You see that? That is the Sagrada Familia, which is the famous church in Barcelona. And isn't that, isn't that really cool? Like in the amount of time, yeah. And I just saved you guys like eight hours of looking through photos of cathedrals. Wasn't that great? All right, so that's an example of how we're really pushing the boundaries on how we interact with search. The other thing that Marissa was talking about was how we're actually incorporating more and more of the internet into our search. And uh, we, she talked a little about a universal search. And so I'm going to show you guys the latest, uh, the latest thing that we've added to universal search, which is integration of music, where, so this is a spreadsheet, which is not Google search, but we're going to now open up a new tab here. We're going to go there. And uh, so we've integrated music in so that you can find, you can actually find not just text web pages, but you can actually find audio as well and music. So Marissa, like, challenge me here. Like, like give, me, give me a song. What's the latest song you heard? So Jack knows I'm really bad with music because I don't know bands and I don't know song titles. But what I tend to do is listen to the radio and listen to phrases of songs that I like. So the other day, and actually a few times now on the way to work, I've heard a song that has the phrase in it, something about the world turning slowly. All right. Or the world, the earth turns slowly, something okay, like okay. that. OK, not OK, making, OK, not making it easy for me. Uh, we're, gonna, we're now going to do a partial lyrics query here. And let's see how this goes. So we go, the world turns Slowly, all right. Here we go, oh, whoa, there you go, hey. And you know, the, the crazy thing about this, so there's, there's two things worth mentioning here. One is that you can just open this up and it'll just start, start playing and we can listen to the entire song right here on the search results page. The other thing that's worth pointing out about this query is that that's even actually the wrong lyrics. Like the actual line is, and planet Earth turns slowly, but just from the fact that like the, we, we were able to synonymize world with Earth and all these kind of crazy things, we could actually get the right song right there, right for you, right away. So that's pretty cool. So the next thing, so we're now, now we've talked about bringing things into search and how we interact with search. The next thing we're talking, we're going to bring it even, even closer to home. We're going to talk a little bit about personalization. Um, one of the latest things that we've launched is uh, the ability to star searches in, in your search results right there. So it's really easy. And Marissa, you had a good example of, of how this was useful to you recently. Sure. Well, I was looking for different things uh, to cook for dinner. I don't get to cook very much, but when I do, I want to make something elaborate. And one of the things that I tend to order in restaurants but have never made at home is asso buco. So I was searching for asso buco recipes uh, to get an idea of what to cook. And here, what you can do is you can actually surf through here, find recipes. I actually really liked one of these results here, which is cooking for engineers. This one's good. <laughs> There's a whole yeah. <laughs> recipe book that speaks our language. Um, yeah, step by step. This, is, this is great, right up our alley. And so this I thought was the best result. And what we've done now is we've incorporated into search stars. They work like stars in Gmail, so you can basically keep, you can bookmark a result and keep it around and return to it later. So we'll go ahead and star it. And then what that does, that actually means that that result will appear on the top of your search results when you search for, say, Asabuco in the future. Yeah. You'll see it pop up to the top. I'm going to go ahead and start another one just for, just for kick, so that when we rerun this search, there you go, right there at the top. And the other cool thing to note about this feature is that, um, you know, I, un unlike Marissa, I, I, like, I forget everything. And so, you know I, don't know, I don't know if you guys, when we were flipping through that page, could remember all those ingredients for Osobuco, or even like that it's called Osobuco. But this syncs to your, this, all this information about your bookmarks syncs up to the cloud so that then when I take my, my handy dandy phone and I'm at the supermarket, I'm like, yeah, Marissa told me to get like beef and something. I can actually then just pull up, I can even do the query like Oso. And, uh, and I'll have these results right here, right at the top of my search results, so that I'll be able to get the right stuff. So that's, that's really cool. So one last demo that we wanted to show you guys is uh, now expanding back out to the, to the entire internet. Um, I, don't, I don't know about you guys, but I actually don't speak every language on the earth. Um, but, but you know, there's a lot of really good content written in those other languages. Um, and so one of the things that, one of the really exciting technologies that we've done, that we've been developing, is taking our machine translation, which you've seen featured in a lot of these other demos, and actually using that to give you access to the whole, the whole, of, the, whole of the web, regardless of what, content, what language um, that content was written in. So Marissa, I hear you were planning a trip to Europe. Yeah, so my husband and I were looking at maybe going to the south of France and doing some bicycling. But what's hard about this is actually the best pages about cycling or, cy or bike routes in the south of France are actually written in French, which I don't speak. 
So what you can do with clear is you can actually do that query, have it do the translation for you, and find those pages that are written in those languages. All right, so let's try like cycling routes in the south of France. That sounds pretty cool. France, there we go. And what you notice here is that we've taken the query, and in that like in those second, in that less than a second that it took to run this query, we've taken cycling routes and we've turned it into, we've translated it to French, we've run the query over all of the French documents that we know about, and then we've retrieved those documents and then translated them back to English for you right here. And so that is pretty cool. And so you, and if you look through here, you'll see that there are these pages which, you know, if if it were not for trans the, the this kind of translation thing you would not be able to, like this would be totally inaccessible to, to, to most of the folks who don't speak French. And this is really great you know, local content here. So hopefully these demos give you a bit of a sense of how we're pushing in modes, media, personalization, and language to really try and envision the future of, of search. These are all available, and there's, there, there are demos available on the web for all of these. So you can try out Google Goggles and Clear, uh, as well as our stars on search. And we're really excited um, about what's to come. So I want to thank Jack for helping me with the demos today. Thanks, all of you, for coming. Thank you.